So we officially ended our series in 1 John last Sunday, but there's actually a ton of stuff in 1 John that we did not cover in this series uh, because it didn't fit into the scope of what I wanted that series to look back, look like when I planned it back uh, several months ago. But a lot has changed, obviously, in the last several weeks uh, since I put this series together, uh, which I did a few months ago. Uh, so I'm changing the preaching calendar. I was originally going to start a new series uh, today, and um, it just wouldn't fit in what's going on right now. So, so what I'm going to do it gives me the freedom to poke around a little more in First John and just pull some more nuggets out of here. There's some really good sections in First John that are just rich in, in some really good thoughts. And uh, uh, like I said, it didn't fit into the scope or the, through the filter of I write these things so that you may know, which is what that last series was based on. Um, but it does have some good stuff for us. Uh, today's section that we're looking at addresses the Antichrist. The Antichrist. You've heard the term many times, all right? Uh, and it may be probably one of the most misunderstood concepts in all of Scripture. But if you just read it for what it says, the only place you'll find this term is in 1 John. And if you just read what it actually says, it will clear up a ton of misunderstandings of what the Antichrist is. So let's, let's just look at it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 is where we'll start. Children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know, we know this is the last hour hour. <laughs> Holy cow. This, this verse is packed with all kinds of good stuff in it that completely blows out some misconceptions that we have in our, in our culture today uh, about what the Antichrist is. So this is going to be really hard. I know it's, it's going to be hard, almost impossible for you and for me, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to try and forget anything you ever have heard about Antichrist. I mean, just just Try to block it out. I'm going I'm to remind you of some of it, but, but try to block it out. Forget the movies you have seen and the things it says about the Antichrist. Forget the Bible studies you've gone to where everybody sits in a corner around a circle and talks about, oh, here's what the Antichrist will look at. They're always wrong, almost always. I'm, I mean, so rarely do I hear people that are actually correct about, about this. Try to forget the sermons even you've heard about what signs to look for in the last end. I can't believe how many preachers like completely blow this one. All right, and it's, it's just what it is. Forget the books you've read, including really popular series like the Left Behind series. It was so popular a few years ago, completely off base, completely, all right, when it comes to actually what the scripture says. Forget every internet search you've ever done for Antichrist. Even very reputable websites will tell you that the Antichrist is this combination of some of these mysterious characters found in the Bible that, that we don't know how to characterize them, we don't know how to categorize them. Um, some, some comes from symbolic writing, some comes from, I mean, I mean it's just, we, we just try to figure this out and, and we, we just mess it all up. There's these figures uh, mentioned in Revelation, in uh, Second Thessalonians, in Daniel, I mean, and other places, and we try to pour it all into this one dude called the Antichrist, and it's completely wrong. They will identify him as the beast from Revelation. They see him as this brutal, bloody, uncontrollable, diabolical dictator who's going to pretty much eventually rule the entire world into a rebellion against God and will deceive the multitudes. They see him as a man with a supernatural evil power that, that will symbolically revive the Roman Empire into a great powerful nation, kind of like uh, the, the Jews are always waiting for Israel to be reborn to a nation. The, the, the Gentiles are going to have their own version of that in, in the Antichrist. And, and they will lead over this one world government. They'll have the largest army on record at his beck and call. They see him as a man who will exalt himself over God, that he will try to exalt all things over God. Not that that happens anywhere else in society, right? But this one guy, the Antichrist, is going to do that. He will speak with powerfully persuasive words. His source of strength will come straight from Satan himself. Maybe he'll be the son of Satan. You know, maybe, I mean, some people suggest that. He'll die from a mortal wound, somehow be resurrected, which will cause people everywhere to follow him. They'll put some kind of number on their foreheads or implants and microchips, whatever, in their bodies. His 
will have in somewhere buried in his head the number 666 on it. Now, now what this does is this sells a lot of books. It makes for a lot of scary movies. It makes a lot of money for Hollywood. It leads to some exciting uh, conversations in small groups. But I want you to try to forget all of that if you can. Because that's probably the image that comes to mind when you hear the term Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? And you, you, you try to figure out, oh, who is it? Is it this guy? If you just Google it, you'll see uh, pictures of presidents, current and past, of uh, world leaders, uh, religious leaders. I mean, <laughs> all these people that people say, this is the Antichrist. He's going to take over the world. Watch out. Uh, just, just try to forget all of that if you can for a little bit. I mean, I mean every last bit of it because it has absolutely nothing to do with what John is talking about in 1 John chapter 2, which is the only place that the term Antichrist comes in the Bible. It's in 1 John. So, I mean, so, so, so put all that stuff aside. Throw, throw it out. Throw it out. Let's read the verse again and just look at it in the context of what John, the one who wrote it, is, is talking about. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Children, this is the last hour and as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now, what does that say? Many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. All right, say that out loud with me, wherever you are. <laughs> Many Antichrists have come. Many Antichrists have come. Tells us a couple really important things that, that blows everything out of the water the, of what you hear and read in books and movies and all that stuff. Two, two important things. One, there are many antichrists, right? Many. There are lots of them. Many. Not just one, not a world power, not a beast, not a supernatural person who can twist minds and come back from the dead. It's not someone who leads an army. There are many antichrists, plural. Lots. More than one, several. You, you get it, what I'm saying, right? There, there are many. And secondly, they already existed in the first century, right? So there's, there's a bunch of them, and by the 90s AD, they're already there. It's not something we're looking forward to someday, right? It's not a mysterious single person that will come in the future, and we're all trying to figure out who it might be. Maybe it's the Pope. Maybe it's the president. Maybe it's the Russian guy. Oh, no, it's got to be that guy in the Middle East. It's not that. There's many of them, and they were already alive 2,000 years ago. Now, the last hour that he refers to, because we, we see this Antichrist, so therefore we know, oh, it's the last hour. Everybody freaks out. Are we in the last days? Yes. Are we in the last hour? Yes. When you see the term like the last hour in the scripture that we've been using since the first century, the Bible, what it means by that is very simple, that we are in a period of time somewhere between the ascension of Jesus Christ, so death, burial, resurrection, hung out with the disciples for a while, there's the ascension when the disciples are all going, whoa, he's going up into the sky, and an angel says, what are you looking at? He's coming back. Don't worry about it. So sometime between that point in time and the point in time when he comes back to claim his church as his bride. That is the last hour in the spectrum of eternity. We are in the last hour. We have been in the last hour for a couple thousand years. All the things, oh, earthquakes and all these things we're supposed to look, be looking for, yeah, that's been going on forever, and it's going to continue to go on forever. Uh, it's, it's, we are in the last hour. So there's no mysterious timeline to the end of the world. It has nothing to do with what Israel is or is not doing, the nation Israel. It has nothing to do with some mysterious man who is or isn't coming and whether he has a tattoo or a computer chip in his body. It has nothing to do with a war in the Middle East that may or may not happen, and they've been happening as long as I can remember and long before any of us were born. It has nothing to do with a Godzilla-type creature who's going to come crawling out of the water to cause havoc in the world. Jesus himself said, hey, when it comes to my return, when it comes to the end, I have no idea. I don't, have, I don't know when it is. I, I can't tell you when it is. I can't tell you the year. In Matthew 24, 36, he says, concerning that day, the end, right? That day, an hour, nobody knows. No one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, only the Father, right? The Father only knows that. 
There are many, many things for Christians to be concerned about when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to living out our faith. Uh, the Antichrist is not one of them. Don't let this get you all riled up. Don't, don't, let, don't waste any time reading books and trying to follow timelines and, and, and put people's n names into numbers and you know, all, all that stuff. Right? Uh, at least, maybe put it this way, we shouldn't be concerned with Antichrist the way we usually are concerned with Antichrist. John, the apostle, right, the only one left at this point at the time of writing, the one who, who knows what he's talking about, says there are multiple Antichrists. And in the first century, they're already here. Right? So, so calm it down. Calm it down. right? And he continues in verse 19. They went out from us. Hmm. Okay? They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are all, that they all are not of us. So these antichrists that were already present in the first century, <clears throat> these people were once associated with the church. They once attended the church meetings, the gatherings where they gathered together in fellowship and in community and teaching and the things that they did, the Lord's Supper, the stuff they participated in. They acted <clears throat> as if they were part of the group. They acted as if they shared the faith that others had. But at some point, they decided to back out of their commitment to Christ and to leave the church. Now, who knows? Maybe they just got lazy. I think we all go through periods of, of, of uh, apathy, and we have to be waking up once in a while, right? Maybe they got lazy. Maybe there was um, a pandemic or something that kept them all at home for a few weeks, and they suddenly lost the habit. And then when it came time to come back, they kind of lost interest. They were already used to doing new things and different traditions on Sundays, so it was easier just to lay around at home than actually go and be with the church. Maybe they just decided Christianity is just, man, it's just too hard. I mean, honestly, let's get real. Christianity is not easy. This is not the easy life that some of the TV preachers would love you to think it is. Uh, it, it is tough sometimes. But they were part of the church. And at some point, for whatever reason, they left the church and started living in such a way that it was obvious they did not believe what the Bible says. Now, I've been... I've been preaching a long time. I've been preaching a long time. I have seen hun literally hundreds and hundreds of people over the years become part of the church. I've seen them get involved. I've seen them get baptized. I've seen them be all excited and tell everybody about their faith. I've seen them study and read and pray and grow in Christ. I've seen some of them get to the point where they decided, uh, for whatever reason, you know what, maybe not. I mean, people who were so on fire later on are like, eh, may, may, I don't get it. I just don't, I just don't, think I, I don't think I really believe anymore. Maybe they don't get it. Maybe they don't want it. I don't know. Maybe they just don't believe what we're teaching. But for whatever reason, people can attend. People have attended Pathway for years and then just kind of floated away like, eh. Never even told anybody, hey, by the way, or, you, know, eh, you know, but that's just what happens. That's just what happens. And it's not just a Pathway thing. Because it has happened here. It's, it's not just a modern American church thing, like, oh, the church in America, they're just a mess. You know I mean? It's, it's not that. John tells us that's been going on since the early days of the church, even when John was a preacher, the last living apostle, the last one who physically saw Jesus die on the cross and physically saw him in his resurrected state and physically saw him ascend back into heaven, and he's waiting in that last hour for Jesus to come back, right? Even him as a preacher, people still came, and later on were like, eh, maybe not. Reminds me of a, of a story Jesus told a parable. He, 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 it was quite a story. I'm not going to read the text or anything. But he talks about a man who goes to plant seeds in a field. And the farmer's out, and he's just sowing the seed, how they did it back then. They didn't have the big you know, planters like we have, obviously. 
today. And, and so he's throwing the seeds along in, in the field, and, and some seeds, he says, falls on the, the rocky soil. And the seeds take root, and they grow. They have the plants, and, and, and the plant begins to grow. But the sun's beating on it, and, and because it's rocky, it, it just doesn't take root as strongly as, as it needs to be a healthy plant. It's too shallow, and then the plant burns up in the hot sun. And basically, Jesus says, these are believers who start out strong, right? They're like, yeah, they're excited, they're on fire, but then they fade away at some point and leave. I've seen them. We've had them here. You've known people. He talks about the, the, some of the seeds that the farmer throws are, are, uh, fall on the hard path where people are walking. It's almost as hard as cement. Uh, some people say it might be even harder than cement. It doesn't matter how hard it is. The point is, is the plant, the seed doesn't go into the soil, and, and the birds see it sitting there. And just like if they see a piece of sandwich on the sidewalk, they fly down and they eat the, they eat the seed. They eat the seed. And so it's the message of God that never, I mean, you might say, hey, come to church. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. People are like, nee. Okay. That's just the hard, that's the hard soil, the hard path that the seed falls on. It doesn't take root. It doesn't grow. It just disappears. It's Satan's there snatching it away. Nobody, and there are people out there who you can tell the gospel to, and they just, not interested, not interested. It's been going on for a long time, not just today. He talks about some of the seeds that the farmer throws, goes into the weeds, and, and the seeds take root, and they grow, and it isn't good, decent soil, but there's a lot of weeds there, and, and it grows with the weeds, and everything's doing fine, but eventually, the weeds are so strong, just like it is in your own garden, eventually, the weeds will choke out the life of the plants. And Jesus says, hey, that's the people who accept the word, accept faith in him, and they're growing in their faith, but all the worries of life, what are we going to do, what's going to happen, I don't know what to do, oh, things are terrible, all the concerns of life surround them and choke out their faith, gives them no room to breathe, and pretty soon they just walk away, ah, this Jesus thing, I tried it, it didn't work, it didn't work. And he says the farmer sows, throws some of the seed, hopefully most of them, in the good soil, and it takes roots, and it, and it, works, and it grows, and it multiplies a hundredfold, and, and then there's more seeds the next year, and it just kind of keeps going. That's how the crops keep growing, because it keeps making more seeds, and, and it's a good thing. And he's talking about that's the Christian. That, that's the believer in Christ, the follower of Jesus, who someone told you the gospel, you believed it, you accepted it, you started studying the scripture on your own, you started praying, you started developing your faith, you didn't just wait for people to do it for you, you took personal ownership in your faith, and, and you grew deep roots, so when hard times came, you're like, man, this is a hard time, I'm glad I have God, rather than, man, it's a hard time, why did God do this? It's a completely different perspective. That's the person whose soil uh, seeds fell in the good, healthy soil. Now, John would say, if he were to take that story and put it in the context of what he's saying in 1 John, that the Antichrist is, is those that were part of the rocky soil and the weeds and the hard path. The people who, who maybe at some point had some acknowledgement of Jesus, but, but the, at least two of the three, not the hard soil, but the, 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 the weeds and the rocky part, and then they, they turned away. At some point, they said, I don't believe this anymore. I'm not sure if I ever did. I don't know. It's, I'm just not, it's not for me. That is the Antichrist that John is talking about. Some reject it immediately. Some let it grow a while, their faith, and then it fades. Some give it a try, and it's just too hard. These are the Antichrist. It's not a demon. It's not um, a, a son of Satan. It's anyone who hears the message of Christ and rejects it. It's anti. It's against. I'm against Jesus. <clears throat> you know what I think is going to happen through this pandemic? I know everybody has their, their opinions and, and predictions. Um, th this, this is what I think, for, for whatever it's worth. I think the Christians are going to be just fine. I mean, sure, it's hardship, and it's rough, and, and it's uncomfortable, and, and our hair is getting goofy, uh, and, and, you know, stuff like that. I, I don't have the freedom to just go out and do what I want whenever I feel like it. I mean, stores are closed, restaurants are closed, all that, all that stuff. All right? It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. But our faith isn't wavering. Matter of fact, we can't wait to get back together. I mean, we're, we're doing this, this 
uh, parking lot thing or, 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 or this um, live stream thing. It's, and we're, we're talking, we're chatting on the chat. You know, I mean, it's like we're doing what we can. We're doing the Zoom meetings and all that kind of stuff. We're doing what we can. But, man, we can't wait for things to get back to normal. And it will. It, it, really, it really will. Uh, we're not losing interest in church. We're not losing interest in, in Jesus. We still pray. We, we have a Bible. We read it. You know, we're figuring out ways to, to connect with our church family and everything. But the Antichrist, those who really aren't in it for Jesus, they may be just in it for a social gathering, the social aspect of it, the religious feeling of, hey, I went to church, I did something good today, positive vibes, right? Them, they're probably going to fade away. Yeah, I mean, in, in all the churches across the land, the whole world is struck with this thing. There's going to be a lot of people who probably just kind of fade away. And when the church fires back up like normal, they're going to already have new habits established on Sunday mornings that do not include being part of a church. And they'll have reason, oh, there might be a virus there. And there's always been viruses around. I mean, you know, <laughs> oh no, it's, it's a group of people. You know, we intentionally got a smaller building to be more intimate, uh, so it's not like a monster group of people. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine here, you know. And here's the deal. If they get to that point where they fade away, they lose interest, and they, they probably really weren't in in the first place. It was just a religious ceremony they were taking part of, not an expression of their identity in faith with Christ. I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, ever just fade away from my family. They're always my family. Every time I see them, I'm like, it, it's, it's, whether it's been six months or, or two weeks or, or whatever, they're like, it's my family. You know, this, that's what the church family is to me. Because of my faith in Christ and their common faith in Christ, the fellowship that John talks about in chapter 1, this is family. Yeah, they, they can't fade. They can't fade. Uh, but it will for some. It will. Now, don't give up on these people, whoever they are or wherever they are. Maybe you work with someone who will fade away from their church. Encourage them to go back. Encourage them. Don't give up on them. Invite them. Welcome them back. Welcome them here. We all go through times of spiritual laziness, and this will kick into some. Some, some, some part of it will just be legit believers who just like kind of get spiritually lazy. I get that. But some will never come back because they weren't really there in the first place. John says this to the church, continuing on in, in 1 John, in verse 20. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. Who, he's talking to the church. The church. You have been anointed by the Holy One. And you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you, remain in you. Right? If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Let that faith stick in you, right? And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. <clears throat> so John clearly identifies the Antichrist in verse 22. This is the Antichrist, he says. So you're wondering, who's the Antichrist? Who's it going to be? Where is he coming from? Who is this guy? He says it right here. This is the Antichrist. I can't make it any plainer than that. I mean, I know the next time the next movie comes out, you know, oh, do you think that's the Antichrist or some weird story comes out? Do you think that's it? No, I don't. Because John says, this is the Antichrist. Okay? Here's the answer for you. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. See, the Antichrist is not a scary beast coming to get us. We get all freaked out by this. The Antichrist is someone who's not a follower of Jesus Christ. Is it scary? No. Is it sad? Yeah. It's very sad. Because what that is saying, what that means, is, is that you work with the Antichrist. Yeah. 
There are people where you work, when you get back into your work, <laughs> that are the Antichrist. Now, don't look at them weird. Don't label them. Don't call them that. Don't, don't kind of freak out with that. But, but they are. They're just the Antichrist. The Antichrist is your neighbor who says, oh, I believe in something out there. I, I, yeah, I believe in God. They don't follow Jesus. It's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is running Hollywood. The Antichrist is working at the restaurant that you love to go to. Aren't you looking forward to going to a restaurant again? <laughs> the Antichrist is changing diapers at the daycare where your children go. The Antichrist write the popular songs that we sing as we drive down the street. And the books and the magazines and the blogs, whatever it is that we digest and read for entertainment. If anyone, it is anyone who doesn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and follow him as Lord, that's the Antichrist. Are we scared of them? No, 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 no. Do we hate them? Of course not. No. Do they make us angry? No, no. Should it freak you out? No, it shouldn't. They've always been, and they always will be. What it should do is motivate you. Man, I work with Antichrist. Let's see if we can't turn that around. Let's see if we can't make that a pro-Christ, <laughs> you know? Maybe they left the church because they were forced to go as children and, and never really did believe, but they were forced to act like it. And then, then the, they, they grew up and they were like, yeah, I don't think so. The, see, the thing is, the truth is inside them. They, they, they may be pushing it back, but it's there. It, it, it's there, right? And now it might seem kind of awkward to come back because it's been so long. But you know what? Maybe all they need is another reminder. I know you've already reminded them. Maybe they, all they need is one of their peers, one of their friends to say, hey, can I just come back to church? What's it going to hurt? Honestly, really. Is it that, I mean, is it that terrible? It's not. Maybe they just need another invitation. Maybe it's somebody who has tried church out for a while, and, but never really pr pr properly discipled. And, and, and man, I think that's got a ton of people out there. They can say, oh yeah, I used to do church, but they weren't really discipled. They just went to church. I mean, the church means, well, uh, I've meant well <laughs> over the years. Man, I've done a terrible job of discipleship. If there's one regret I have in my life, I look back and think, I've been screaming discipleship my entire ministry. I mean, it was pounded into our lives in college. We exist to make disciples. I mean, there is no doubt in my mind, Matthew 28, that is exactly what that verse says. But man, I've done a terrible job of discipling. We mean well, but what we do is we, we just throw a class together and say, just go to this class and you'll be discipled. Now, that's, that, that's a piece. That's a piece and a critical piece, but that's not full-on discipleship. That's just a cookie-cutter experience. We're all together learning the, the same thing. We put them in a small group and hope, hope that they just move along with their faith. And again, that's, that's a good, that's, it's positive, it's wonderful. Matter of fact, I'm going to encourage that but rather than walking along someone in a one-on-one -on -one relationship or one-on-two -on -two relationship, saying, hey, man, let's, 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 let's talk about our faith. That's discipleship, not an hour a week. It's doing, doing life together. It's living this out together. That's how we develop. That's how we grow. That's how we, we disciple one another. It's, it's not through a lesson, although that's part of you know, bringing the, the faith to the people, but, but it, it's not all of it. Part of it's just doing life. My greatest memories in life are the experiences I've had with people as I've watched them react to things and, and, and combine that with the lessons they teach. That's powerful. That's, that's discipleship. So maybe there, there's a ton of people out there who tried out church for a while, but were never properly discipled. What we all need to do, all of us, the entire church, anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus, every single believer, we need to step up our discipleship efforts. Yes, small groups are essential, but we can do better with that. Our Sunday morning programming is critical for this. Yes, it's a piece of the pie, but you have to come. <laughs> you have to come to it. 
the men's groups, the women's groups, the teens groups that all meet on Wednesday night, those are huge in our discipleship process. It is us processing out our faith. Again, just because we offer it doesn't mean you're a disciple. You've got to be a part of it. You've got to be uh, in, engaged in, in this stuff. They mean nothing if you don't take part in the conversation. We have anywhere from four to six guys that come to the men's group, sometimes eight. I mean, we've had more. But, man, there's a ton of guys who aren't being discipled. That, that's probably the most discipleship setting we have is it, that Wednesday night thing. You're missing out, I'm telling you. You're missing out. If you're not allowing yourself to be discipled in a setting like that. Our generation has, has equated going to church. I just go to church. I'm a Christian. We've equated that with living out our faith. That isn't living out our faith. That's just attending a service. And in many cases, most cases, it's being served by the church, not being the, the church. And the thing is, you can, you can serve uh, attend services for decades and never actually live out your faith. Well, what good was that? What good is that? See, our job, maybe, maybe there's all these people out there who just did that. They played the game for a while, and then they faded away, and they just need someone to say, hey, come, come, on, come on back. Let me walk this with you this time. Come back. Come back to church, and, and let me walk alongside you in this faith. You call me, you text me, you Zoom me. Is that going to be a new thing now? Uh, 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 anytime you want, and we'll talk faith. It won't be, well, let me call the preacher. He's the professional. You know, let's wait till Sunday. That's when we do discipleship. No, it'll be us doing faith. That's what we need, is all of us to engage in that type of behavior. There are people, all antichrists, all around us who tried and then, eh, because they weren't really discipled. And you have the knowledge to disciple people. You have it. That's what John has been saying all along. It doesn't matter if you have a college degree. It doesn't matter how studied you are. Do you know Jesus? You have the Holy Spirit of the living God inside you. And yeah, there'll be tough times. Yes, there'll be times you won't be able to answer a question. But you know how to find it, don't you? You are responsible for going into the world where the Antichrist is and bringing them back and bringing them back into this church, the church of Jesus Christ. This one's fine, too. <laughs> that is our job, to go into the world and find them, introduce them to, if needed, persuade them to become followers of, of Jesus. Like, like, like John said, you have been anointed by the Holy One. You have knowledge. He says in this context, right, in these verses we just read, You've been anointed by the Holy One. You have knowledge. Let that truth abide or remain in you. And share that truth with someone who needs to know it. That is literally, that is literally our purpose in life. That's why we're still here. Otherwise, man, give me that virus and let me go home. Because <laughs> what, else, what else am I here for? It's that. And what a time to do it during the pandemic. Have you, have you read some of the stuff out there? Bible sales are soaring right now. They're just way up. Church is, is up. I know not in, in physically, but, but through, through virtual attendance. Uh, all kinds of people are, are, are watching services. I've seen people click onto our service. I'm like, whoa, didn't see that coming, right? But they have, they have, and they're listening and they're watching whether it's ours or somebody else's, the churches, they have, all the churches are virtual suddenly. I mean, you, if you, you've got to try to not see a church if you're online somewhere. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of hard. They're searching for God. They're looking for peace. I have seen legitimate fear in the eyes of people when I go to the grocery store. I mean, they look at me like, if you're coming down the aisle, they're like, oh, no, what, no, what am I going to do? It's like, I'm, I, you know, yeah. I mean, fear. They don't need to fear. They need the God of peace in their life. <clears throat> now, if you're, if you're watching right now or, or listening right now, please, please don't get freaked out if, that you're thinking, wait a minute, John's calling me the Antichrist. Don't get freaked out by that. Any more than you get freaked out if someone said, man, you're an anti-Brussels sprouts person. You're like, well, of course I am. I don't like Brussels sprouts. Just be honest. Maybe you haven't really liked Jesus a whole lot. 
That, that's kind of the whole thing. None of us liked Jesus a whole lot until we like decided, whoa, he died for me? He's given me a way to forgive my sins? He's given me a new way to live? And we make this turn in our life, it's called repentance, and we start living for him. So when John calls you an antichrist, don't get freaked out. He just means you're not a believer yet. You're not a follower of Jesus yet. And I want you to know you're welcome here. You're welcome at Pathway to figure out how to, how to do that walk, the Christian walk. We would love to disciple you. We would love to connect you with someone who can teach you how to live your faith out. And if you are a believer, here's what you do. Check on your neighbors this week. Have you done that yet? Especially the Antichrist. <laughs> Check on your neighbors. How are they doing? Check on your coworkers. I never talked to them at work. So, wouldn't it be cool to think someone just calls a hey man, or sent a text or an email or however you communicate with them? I just wonder how you're doing. It's been a while. Man, that could mean volumes to someone. Check on the people you rub shoulders with this week. And Christian, get your life on mission. It's time to crawl out of the, the foxholes, you know, and, 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 and reach and change this world. Like the, the church has always done through these times, always through history. This is when the church shines. So go shine. 